There's nobody like him, Jesus. I'm glad to know that we can make our way to the Father. I was thinking about the prodigal son. Wasted his life, his inheritance, on wild, riotous living. Found himself in a mess, out with the hogs. The Bible says he come to himself, and he went back to the Father's house. I'm so glad to know that I can always make my way back to the Father's house. We appreciate your presence today. Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. We looked at verses 1 through 4 last week. We talked about our relationship, our unity, our fellowship, our partnership, our communion, and how it's all based on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our joy, our peace is based on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad to know that gospel is unchanging. And I'm glad to know that Jesus is on the throne and in control. Last week, the Apostle Paul did not give us the example of himself, did he? He gave us the example of Christ. And today, we're going to look at chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And I want to preach a message simply entitled, There's Nobody Like Jesus. Friend, can I tell you there's nobody like Jesus in heaven above? There's nobody like Jesus on this earth beneath. There's no one like King Jesus. There's been some wonderful men that have walked this mud ball planet. Men like Moses and Isaiah and Daniel and the Apostle Paul who by divine inspiration wrote the book of Philippians. But can I tell you one Jesus outshines a thousand Pauls. One Jesus outshines a thousand Isaiahs. One Jesus he is the greatest of the greatest. He is the highest of the highest. He's the holiest of the holiest. I'm so thankful that he is my Lord. He is my Savior. He is my friend. His name is Jesus. Philippians chapter number 2. Let's begin reading with verse number 5. And God's word says this. Let this mind be in you all, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Some of your translations might say, didn't consider it to be robbery or equal with God. But he emptied himself, taking upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in the form of a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, oh, that was the negative. Here's the positive. Therefore, God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Isn't that an awesome passage of Scripture? Let's go to the Lord in prayer once again. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that we can run to your arms. Thank you that we can make our way there only because of your grace. Lord, I'm thankful that when I wasn't looking for you, you came looking for me. When I wasn't searching for you, you came searching for me. And God, you found me. And you saved me. And you cleaned me up. And you accepted me. You adopted me in your family. And you justified me freely by your grace. You've made a difference in my eternity. You'll make a difference in my death. You're making a difference in my life. Lord, I'm going to fail today because I stand here before these people trying to explain how wonderful you are. I could never do that with just mere words. The Apostle Paul was even having a hard time with that by divine inspiration, finding the words to use. Lord, when our language falls short, when we can't put your greatness, your love, who you are into words. God, I pray that you'll demonstrate your power and your presence around us, in us, and through us. 
Lord, everybody here that's experienced your grace and the transforming power of the gospel, they know what I'm talking about. Lord, I pray that others will receive your grace today. And they'll trust the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse them from all of their sins. Go with us now. Help this preacher to preach. We ask it in the strong and wonderful name of your son, Jesus. Have the same mind of Jesus. Have the same attitude as Jesus. Think like Jesus. If you're going to be like-minded with somebody or have the attitude of somebody, may it be more than Brother Reggie. May it be more than a mom or a dad or a school teacher or a doctor or a counselor. May we have the mind of Christ. So he's boldly telling them this is the way you should think. This is the attitude you should possess in humility. And then he goes on and he gives the greatest example that he could have ever given. And that example is Christ. I don't ever want to be that preacher that's guilty of writing myself as the example into the text. I'm not the example. I'm far from it. I never want to be one of those preachers that emphasizes and exalts Paul who was just a man who needed to be saved just like you and me, right? If we're going to exalt somebody, if we're going to extol somebody, if we're going to look with fleshly eyes toward an example, may that example be a spiritual example and may that example be none other than the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. These are some of the richest verses, ladies and gentlemen, in all of the New Testament. I have found myself overwhelmed again and again and again as I have studied and prepared for this message this week. You know, many scholars believe that these verses was praise chorus. That was sung by folks just like you and me in the early church. They called it the doxology of Christology. What that simply means is the praise of King Jesus. The adoration of King Jesus. I would love to be able to find the song. I would love to give it to see him, the praise band, and let them put it into words. You know why? Because the greatest song we could ever sing are songs about Jesus. The greatest messages we could ever hear are messages about Jesus. The greatest relationship that we can ever have is not with a mom or a dad or a husband or a wife, but it's with Jesus. Who is Jesus? Depending on who you are, you're going to have an answer for that question. You can't just ignore him. You can't just act like he doesn't exist. He's the most influential person in human history. Who is Jesus? This is the most important question that you'll ever have to answer in your lives. Was he just a good man? Was he a religious leader? Was he a prophet of God? Is there more to him than just this? There are people today that believe he was just a Jewish carpenter. There are some people today that believe he was an angelic being. There are some people today that believe that him and Satan were brothers. There's all kinds of crazy ideologies about Jesus. I've even heard some people believe that Jesus is an alien from a different planet. <laughs> Kind of call for y'all drinking, right? <laughs> Who's Jesus? Can I tell you? My opinion doesn't matter. You said, oh, wait a minute, Brother Reggie. You're our pastor. Yeah. But my, my opinion doesn't matter. Yeah. Mom and dad's opinion doesn't matter. Who can answer this? Right. The Word of God. Yeah. That's it. Do you realize that Jesus claimed that he was God. He was the most influential person in all of human history who claimed that he was God. So there are some people that says he's just a good man. Well, listen, if you claim to be God and you're not God, you're crazy, you're a lunatic, so you can't be a good man. He's either who he says he was 
Or he's the biggest charlatan, imposter, and deceiver who has ever lived. He is either Lord, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. Can I tell you, I believe that he is the Lord. In 1926, Dr. James Allen Francis shared a message about Jesus. It was all of the armies that have ever marched. All of the navies that were ever built, all of the parliaments that have ever sat, all of the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. That's my Jesus. We just sang about him. That's the Jesus that the Apostle Paul is writing about today. What does the Bible say? The Bible says today emphatically that Jesus is God. Jesus claimed himself that he was God. Do you realize that he referred to himself as the great I am, the self-existent one, the timeless God? multiple, multiple times. Do you realize that there are seven major I am statements in the gospel of John alone? I am the bread. I am the living water. I am that manna which came down from heaven. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the great shepherd. I am the light of the world. And it goes on and on and on and on. In John chapter number 10, after saying that he was the good shepherd, I want you to notice the dialogue that he has with religious leaders of the day. He said this, my father and I are one. Again, the Jews took up stones to stone him. And Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from my father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered, we're not stoning you for a good work, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, claim to be God. He came to try to convince the world that he was who the Bible says he is. Listen to what he said to Philip in John chapter number 14. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have also known my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you such a long time, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how could you say, show us the Father? Listen to his testimony to the high priest. As he was standing there being falsely accused. The Bible says, but he kept silent and he answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the living God? Jesus said, I am. There it is again, that timeless definition of who God was in the Old Testament that he spoke to Moses from the burning bush. He says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus believed he was God because he was God. But guess what? His disciples also believed that he was God. One day they were out in Caesarea of Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And you remember some of them said, well, you're John the Baptist or you're Elijah, or you're, you're one of the other prophets. There was a lot of opinion about Jesus at that particular time. And then he makes it personal. He looks at them and he says, but who do you all say that I am? Who do you think that I am? We're talking about who is Jesus? And Peter stood up. And this time he didn't stick his foot in his mouth. He said, you are the Christ. The son of the living God. Specific. He is unique. You know why? Because he was truly God's son. Born.
born of a virgin, manifested deity. He lived as fully God and he lived as fully man. And that's what the Apostle Paul is telling us here in the richness of these verses in Philippians chapter number 2. I want us to think today about his absolute divinity. You say, Brother Reggie, why would you say absolute divinity? Because if he's 99.9% .9 God, we're all in trouble. Oh, went to church this morning, I asked the Tipton kiddos in the van, who's Jesus? One of them said, he's my friend. Thank God, he's my friend. One of them said, he's the Savior. The other one said, he died on the cross. And all of those things are right and all of those things are good. But if he's not God, none of those things are true. He is absolutely divine. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent. He is God. Notice how Paul says it in verse 6. Who being in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped at. These words are so important. The word being is a very interesting word. It's in the present active participle. Now I know that's a blessing to know that. But you know what that means? That means he always was God. He is God currently. He always will be God. He never began as God on this earth. The birth of Jesus did not make him God. The baptism of Jesus did not make him God. Before he ever entered into a virgin womb, he was the sovereign creator. He was the pre-existent deity that spoke everything into existence by the power of his word. He has always been and he always will be. That's what he's saying. Then he says the form of God. I want you to notice he uses the word form in verse 6 and he uses the word form in verse 7. Now, we speak English. We read an English-speaking translation. Those are two totally different words even though they're translated form in English. Being in the form of God is the Greek word morphe. It means essence. It means nature. When we read that, we think, well, he... He looked like God. Well, what does God look like? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Do I look like God? Do you look like God? Does God have fingers and toes? Well, he did when Jesus came to this earth. Right. Amen? Amen? But it's not talking about his outward appearance. It's talking about his nature. It's talking about his essence. And then in verse number 7, he uses the word form, and he says, he took upon himself the form of a servant. That's the Greek word schema. It means the outward appearance. Now, morphe can never change. Schema continually changes. Please stay with me on this. I am a human being that went to a toddler, the little curly-headed thing, right? And it continues to change my schema. There's me and Brittany and Brandy and Miranda. I was probably about 12, 13 years old. Then we progress on and I'm just a little old boy there, right? We progress on. Pretty handsome fella right there. Thank God that I look like that so I could have her or I wouldn't be married today. And then we progress on. There's me and Ash when we were in college. The schema is changing. Can you see that? Then there's us when we got married. It looked like my blood pressure was high. And then we progress on. And there's us on our honeymoon. We went to Hawaii. Our schemas are changing. And then there's me today. Can't help it. Man. And you all know better than that. That's the rock, right? Maybe a 
only similarity is we're both bald headed. <laughs> Do you realize that Jesus' outward form changed? He came as a baby and was a toddler and lived as a little boy. You remember? As a matter of fact, Mary and Joseph lost him. He was out at the temple confounding the doctors and the lawyers with all of this knowledge. And Joseph thought that he was with Mary. And Mary thought that he's with Joseph. And they had an intense moment of fellowship over where is Jesus. And then we find out that he's a man. He gets baptized by John the Baptist. That's not a denomination. That's what he did. He was a baptizer, okay? And then he enters into his earthly ministry. And the last three and a half years of his life has changed the course of history. Even though his outward form changed, even though he grew as a man, he was always divine. He was always in essence God. He was always by nature God. I'm a human. I am living, but really what I'm doing is I'm dying a little bit every day naturally. My schema is changing. I want you to understand that Jesus possessed the unchanging nature and the essence of the character of God while he was on this earth, and he always will. And I also want you to understand that for three and a half years, Jesus said things that only God could say. And he done things that only God could do. Why? Because Jesus is God. That is the absolute divinity of Jesus. Now I want us to think about his amazing humanity. His amazing humanity. Paul goes on to say that he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking upon himself the form of a servant, and he was made in the likeness of men. This is this deep doctrine we call kenosis in theological circles. Jesus was God, but he chose willingly to empty himself of something. And there's a lot of debate in theological circles over what did he empty himself of. Well, Paul has already showed us very clearly that his morphe, his essence, his nature was God. So he did not empty himself of divinity. He is absolutely divine. He is God. So what did he do? Jesus willingly refused to cling to certain privileges of his divinity, of his dignity. And he done that so that he could experience life as a man, as a human being. He never ceased to be God, but he purposefully chose to live as a man. This is not the subtraction of deity. This is the addition of humanity. His morphe, his nature remained the same, but his schema would forever and ever change. I don't want anybody in here today to think that Jesus suspended his deity up until his death. That is false doctrine. And I want us to even think beyond that. Do you realize that even in his essence, even in his nature, his morphe was God? But his schema has been altered forever and will be altered throughout all eternity. Do you realize that there is a man who is the God-man, who is now raised again in a physical spirit body. He has been glorified, but he died a man, was buried a man, rose again as a man, and he sits at the right hand of the Father as a man in his glorified state with nail scars in his hands and in his feet and a sword piercing in his side. You all see that? Forever and ever and ever. He took on that form. Guys, I can't illustrate this. It'd be like me taking on the form of an ant to die for the ants and remaining an ant forever, even throughout all eternity. So, Brother Reggie, I don't understand it. Neither do I. But I believe it. 
And I'm so very thankful for it. You've got to remember that this is the God man that rebuked the wind. You've got to remember this is the God man who was at the marriage feast, but he turned the water into wine. You've got to remember this was the God dead back to life. You've got to remember this is the God man who ate of the fish and the bread. But also took five loaves and two fishes and blessed it and increased it and fed at least 5,000 people. You've got to remember that this was the God man who saw with eyes of compassion and grace but was able to restore sight to blinded eyes. You got to remember that this was the God man who heard every plea, every time somebody called his name. He heard people's struggles, he heard people's failures, he heard people's fears, but he was able to restore hearing to deaf and ears. You got to remember, this was the God man who walked with us, but also had the power to cause the lame to walk again. You got to remember, this was the God man who was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin, who suffered physical infirmity, who got sick, who had to go through things just like me and you, but was able to heal and to cleanse the lepers. You got to remember, this was the God man who realized when people were being demon possessed, but could call out to that demon and deliver them from those unclean spirits because he is truly God manifested in the flesh. You got to remember, this was the God man who was sold for 30 pieces of silver, betrayed by his friend in the garden. And then when those officers came to arrest him and said, are you Jesus? He said, I am he. And his voice was so powerful that all of them fell off of their feet. You got to remember that this is the God man who took Peter, James, and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration and showed them that even though I have purposefully decided to limit some of my privileges, I am still God. And he transfigured himself there before him. How do we combine the divinity with the humanity? Only God can do something like this, y'all. Only God could come up with this plan. Only God could work this out. Only God could come as a man. To do for man what man can never do for himself. To take the sin of fallen sinful man upon himself and pay for it and punish his own son on the cross so that we can go free. Oh, think about the richness of the plan and the purpose of God. He put his deity on display so we would know that he is God. But he put his humanity on display so that he know we would understand and that he cares. Man, this is an amazing text. We see his absolute divinity. We see his amazing humanity. He was like no other man who ever lived he had a birth like no other birth, lived a life like no other life, had a ministry like no other ministry, said things nobody's ever said, done things nobody's ever done, got a name above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue shall confess. He's got a kingdom like we could never even believe, even though we're a part of it. He's got a family that he's trying to grow. Friend, I'm telling you, he's God, but he's man. How can you have a 100% man and a 100% God? Only God can do the impossible. Right. That brings me to his awesome humility. And being found in the form of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. He became a man, lived as a man, ate as a man, slept as a man, loved as a man, laughed as a man, cried as a man, suffered as a man. What humility! 
He was humble that he took on the form of a man and not a more glorious creature. He was humble in that he was born into some kind of obscure, oppressed place. He was humble in that he was born into poverty among the despised people. He was humble in that he was born as a child instead of appearing as some kind of kingly figure. He was humble in submitting to obedience, listening to Joseph and listening to Mary as a child. He was humble in that he learned or he practiced a trade. He was a carpenter. A builder, he used his hands. He was a working man. He was a laborer. He was humble in that the long wait from 12 years old to 30, and finally he goes into his public ministry. He was patient. He was humble in the audience that appealed to and the way that he taught. He was humble in the temptations that he allowed himself to endure. He was humble in the weakness and the hunger and the thirst and the tiredness that he willingly endured. He was humble in the total obedience to his heavenly father. He was humble in the submission to the Holy Spirit. He was humble in choosing and submitting to the death on the cross. He was humble in the fact that he allowed the agony of death to oversweep him and take him. He was humble in the shame and the mocking and all the public humiliation of that cross during that death. He was humble in enduring the spiritual agony of the sacrifice that he was on the cross. Do you realize that he could have said at any time, get me off of this cross? Yeah. And legions of angels would have come to his rescue. Do you realize that King Jesus don't even need a legion of angels? He could have evaporated the whole world on the cross, got himself off the cross, and went on back to heaven, ascended. He'd still be holy. He'd still be righteous. But he was trying to make a way for you. He was trying to make a way for me. The divinity and the humanity, they came together for the purpose of what? The cross. Not an electric chair, not lethal injection, not a firing squad, not public hanging. The worst form of public execution that has ever existed is crucifixion. And he could have chose anything, but this is what he chose for us. He died on the cross for you. And for me, please, please listen to me. I can't think of more awesome, amazing, wonderful humility than that the King of glory, this God, who spoke everything into existence by the power of His Word, would willingly come and live and walk as we are. To die a death that He didn't deserve for sins that He never committed, to pay a debt that he never owed because he wants to fellowship with us. He wants to take us to heaven. <laughs> Last week, I can't even remember who it was, was sitting up here and I used him as an example. I said, I love this brother, Tony. It was Tony. Love Tony. But if I had to pick between Owen and Tony, Owen, Owen's going to live, Tony's going to die. I love Owen. That don't mean I don't love Tony. God willingly gave his son for the Adolf Hitlers, the Mussolinis, the Marilyn Mansons. Reggie Tiptons. Guys, if you don't see nothing else this morning, you might not be able to explain the Trinity. You might not be able to explain kenosis. We can talk about that later if you want to. This is so rich. I'll never plumb the depths of it. But you can't leave here and say, God doesn't love me. Look at the cross. God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died on the cross that we deserve to hang upon to pay for the sins that we committed. 
He is God. He's more than a good man. He's more than a religious leader. He's more than a prophet. He's God. Some of y'all might have been wrestling with that for a long time. Here's the wonderful thing about that. You don't have to take my word for it. Take his word for it. The Spirit of God right now is dealing with some of your hearts. And he's saying, Paul's right. Bro Ridge is right. Jesus is God. And next week we're going to find out that every one of us are going to get to meet him. Either as Lord, Savior, friend, or as judge, jury, and executioner. Oh, I'm not trying to scare you, friend. You might not know the President of the United States of America. I don't. Never met him. I'd love to sit down and talk with him. I don't know the Governor of the State of Kentucky. I'd love to sit down and talk with him. I know the God of glory. His name is Jesus. And guess what? He knows me. And he loves me. And he saved me. And I am his child. But it even gets better than that. I'm adopted into his family and I am a joint heir with him. One day, Reggie Tipton is going to get to rule and reign with Christ. And we can say, woo! a shout and spell. If none of that were true, I'd still serve him. I'd still trust him. I'd still worship him. You know why? Because he's God. Stand to your feet. Father, thank you.